Hello, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Miriam Farah, and I'm one of your Athenaeum fellows for this academic year. Before getting started, I just wanted to remind everyone of two quick things. One, wearing your mask indoors while not actively eating or drinking is highly encouraged by the college. And then two, please take this time right now to silence and put away your cell phones. And please remember that you can't take any video or audio recordings. Thank you. So in California, the ballot initiative process allows citizens to propose laws and even constitutional amendments without the support of the governor or the state legislature. This form of direct democracy can be used as an important tool for political, economic, and social changes. Some of the state's most important issues have been put on the ballot. And this November, there will be seven propositions on the ballot which address a variety of questions regarding the constitutional right to an abortion, sports betting, mandatory funding for K through 12, art and music education, and many other important issues. Tonight, we will hear from two individuals, Professor Ken Miller and Mr. Nicholas Hydorn, who will explain these propositions and their um, consequences. Additionally, we will have a chance to learn more about the Rose Institute's voter, uh, sorry, video voter series, which concisely explain all of these propositions and can be found on YouTube once they're released. So in addition to being director of the Rose Institute for State and Local Government, Professor Ken Miller is a professor of state and local government here at CMC. His research specializes in state government institutions, but specifically direct democracy and the intersection of law and policy. He has numerous publications, including Texas versus California, A History of Their Struggle for the Future of America, and Direct Democracy in the Courts. His law degree from Harvard Law School and his PhD in political science from UC Berkeley have helped him become an expert on state politics, constitutional law, and how the two interact. You'll also hear from Mr. Nicholas Heidorn, who is the founder of Heidorn Con Consulting, which is a firm that focus on, focuses on state and local policy. Previously, Mr. Heidorn was the policy director for the California Common Cause and the founder and director for the California Local Redistricting Project. He has over a decade of experience advocating for voting and governance reforms. He has used his experience to draft Senate Bill 1108 in 2016, which for the first time authorized all California cities and counties to create independent citizen redistricting commissions. Additionally, he was part of the coalition that passed Assembly Bill 849 in 2009, which adopted new criteria and requirements for city and county redistricting. Mr. Hydorn is also a CMC grad, class of 2006, and he is a graduate of Harvard Law School. Tonight's talk is co-sponsored by the Rose Institute of State and Local Government, and we are very excited to have our two speakers here tonight. Um, and now please join me in welcoming both of them. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, I want to say at the outset that I'm thrilled to be able to share this discussion with one of my former students, uh, Nicholas, uh, who was uh, an outstanding undergraduate here at CMC. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I remember about him is he got, was super interested in election uh, law and sort of how elections were run. And he had the idea that it would be good if we had different forms of elections where we could do ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, things like that. And he wrote a senior thesis on that, as I recall. It was his topic. And soon after graduation, he went on to law school, but he also got into the mix of real world electoral reform and got involved with uh, introducing these reforms in the Bay Area in San Francisco and Oakland and has continued that on with uh, redistricting reform in California um, throughout his career. So uh, he also knows a lot about the initiative process and public policies up in Sacramento. He's in the mix of things and, and has his 
uh, finger on the pulse of what's going on in uh, state government. So it's, it's fun to stay connected with him and kind of pick his brain about what's going on in Sacramento. And it's great to have you here tonight. So uh, thanks. You want to say hello, and then we can get into the, uh, the program. Sure, yeah. Well, uh, first off, it's uh, such an honor to be here. I remember as a student loving the, these uh, Athenaeum events, and so the ability to be here and, and get to present is really wonderful. And it's particularly fun to be able to present with uh, Professor Miller, who was my professor, gosh, about <laughs> 10 years or so ago. Uh, but also, uh, in that time, I took his California politics class, which introduced me to the fellowship, which got me in the state legislature. So uh, in large part, part of my own trajectory was to Professor Miller. So it's very exciting to be here for multiple reasons. Great, okay, so I'll, I'll just kind of run down what we have planned for this evening. So we have a couple of purposes here, one is to give everybody in the audience sort of an, our overview of the seven propositions that are on the ballot. We do this every two years on the eve of uh, California elections. So uh, the way the state runs things now, ballot measures are in the November election of even numbered years. And so that's when we do these things. And we, uh, in addition, since 2014, I think, the Rose Institute has been working with Rose students to put together uh, these short video um, summaries of these ballot measures. We call it the Video Voter Guide or the Video Voter Project. And so you're gonna, we're gonna show you two of those tonight. The full uh, seven, I think we're gonna release on Monday. And so you can look for those. Uh, a couple of the presenters that will be on screen tonight are here in the audience tonight, Kat and Anna. So look forward to seeing them. This is the, actually, I don't think they've seen these videos yet. <laughs> So this is like the big reveal. We just finished production of them like today or last night, and we're finishing up the rest of them the next couple of days. So this is like a big project for us. We think of it as part of our public education uh, mission of the Rose Institute to uh, disseminate these as widely as possible. So I do hope that you will take a look at them, share them with your family and friends, especially those who live in California, but anybody might be interested in these issues because one point that I think I want to drive home tonight is that things that happen in California spread, right? And so especially some of these things like uh, ZEV vehicles, we'll be talking about those, and how, how do we fund the transition from gas-powered vehicles to ZEV, it's expensive transition. Um, and so one of these propositions deals with that. Is it the best way to do it? You know, you'll decide. But uh, you know, that's just one example of how things that happen in California spread both across the country and around the world. Okay, so we're gonna um, do a little bit, I think, of a discussion of the context of the, 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 the ballot measure process, the initiative process and referendum process in California uh, to give some context. Uh, we'll talk about these, these seven measures. We'll, we'll um, show you a couple of the, uh, the videos and then we'll open it up for, for questions, okay? So that's kind of the plan for the evening. Um, let's see if this is working. Okay, so these are the seven. Uh, the seven measures on the, the uh, November 2022 ballot. You can just see, we're well, not gonna sort of run through them now, we're gonna go through them sequentially, uh, but they, they range from uh, establishing an explicit constitutional right to abortion in the wake of the uh, US Supreme Court's decision in the Dobbs case last summer, um, down to a referendum that would try to overturn the ban on flavored tobacco products in California. So. Again, California is sort of on the, the leading edge of a regulatory issue, uh, seen as a health, uh, health issue. And uh, the legislature passed a law and we'll have an opportunity to vote it up or down. And we'll talk about the other measures in between there as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions we get is, uh, it's, it seems like for, for those of you who um, sort of follow California politics and the media, you, would, you might think, Wow, there's a lot of attention being paid to ballot measures this year. I'm getting a lot of, you know, incoming about like sports betting, right? I can't like escape the uh, incessant advertisement about this. And you might think there's a lot of attention being paid to uh, the ballot and the ballot measures. And you might think, well, is this like an extraordinarily heavy year for ballot measures? As uh, we, we threw up a little graph up there showing that actually this is a light year for ballot measures was seven. Uh, that, that big peak in 2016, with respect to this project that we do, this video project, we, we did like all those uh, measures. That was a lot of video production to do in one like month in uh, 2016. This year, 
It's a little bit lighter with seven, which is kind of good in a way um, to not have to do that much. We could sort of drill down on these individual me measures a little bit uh, better. So that's just uh, showing the, the scale of uh, how many ballot measures are on the California ballot over the last decade. One other thing about California, um, it is one of 24 states in the country that allow citizens to put uh, measures on the ballot. Okay, so in some states, you'll have the legislature putting uh, questions, I mean, almost every state, you'll have the legislature putting measures on the ballot for approval or rejection by the voters. Usually those are constitutional amendments, things like that. Uh, in half the states, you can, uh, there's a mechanism by which citizens can totally bypass the whole representative system and don't have to go through the legislature, don't have to get the governor's approval. It's just like ordinary citizens who get organized well enough to put and put enough money, basically, into uh, putting these things on the ballot. And so uh, that's, that's a mechanism available in half the states. Half the states not, right? Um, and California, of all the 24 initiative states, has used it more than any other state. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, the, the period since the 1970s has been a period of surge in the use of the initiative process in California. Uh, and you can see in 2016, a big spike, but then the, kind of there's ebb and flow, and this is actually on the lower end. So uh, maybe I'll just open up a, a, an initial question for you, Nicholas. Why do you think that this year there are fewer than in recent election cycles? So for all our California voters here, I do have bad news for you. This is probably gonna be, not be repeated anytime soon. That graph is almost certainly gonna go back up and we're gonna see a lot more initiatives in the future. Um, there are a number of factors that probably led to this. Obviously, the, the biggest one is probably the pandemic. It made it really difficult to circulate petitions to qualify things for the ballot. The other thing is it just made it more expensive. So the initiative process is mostly done through paid signature gatherers. In fact, the last time that a like, purely volunteer effort succeeded, I think, was almost 20 years ago. And so in, just to give you a sense of the context, like two years ago, the cost per signature to qualify someone was about $7 per signature. This time around, it was about $16. So more than doubling the cost to get someone on the ballot. So that certainly had an effect. I think a few of the other factors, though, it's kind of like a, a number of small cuts adding up. Some of the other things that we saw this year is the kind of the tail end of some reforms that were enacted previously. So the legislature about in 2014 passed a law saying that once a measure qualifies for the ballot, there's an opportunity for the legislature and the proponents, the people who got it on the ballot, to negotiate and try and cut a deal where the proponents will withdraw their measure from the ballot. And in fact, this year, two measures were withdrawn. You originally hadn't seen very much of it, but I think now proponents and the legislature are getting the hang of that dance. And so we saw two measures relating to plastics, for example, get taken off the ballot this year. And I'd say the last thing is, uh, probably also legislative gatekeeping to a certain extent. So the legislature this year only put one measure on the ballot, that's Prop 1 relating to abortion rights, but they had many other measures that they could have put on the ballot, and as we'll hear about in a little bit, the legislature needs a pretty high vote threshold to put things on, but given the Democratic supermajorities, they could have, and they, they consciously chose to only put one measure on the ballot, in fact, push one to a later ballot, and didn't allow several others to go forward. So I think that was also a conscious attempt by the legislature to limit the number of propositions, to focus on attention, and probably to focus it on Proposition 1, the abortion rights measure. Okay, so you, you mentioned your, in your answer that there's uh, another vehicle for putting measures on the ballot, which is the legislature. And so we, we thought it might be uh, useful to um, describe the seven measures on this ballot and how they got there, uh, what type of measure they are, and, uh, uh, and so this, this ballot actually has an interesting range uh, among the options for getting on the California ballot. So why don't you share a little bit more about that? So as Professor Miller uh, mentioned at the outset, California is one of 24 states that has the initiative process, but we are one of the most frequent users of the initiative process, and that's because California has one of the strongest and most aggressive forms of the initiative. Um, but as Professor Miller mentioned, there are multiple ways you can get things on the ballot. And for those who are interested in process, this is a pretty unique election that we had almost all the different ways that some could get on the ballot actually happen. So just taking it quickly down the line, 
The first way is in California, when you amend the Constitution, one of the ways that you can do that is by the legislature proposing something. That requires a two-thirds vote of each house, and the governor doesn't get to sign it. It skips the governor and goes straight to the voters, and if the voters vote the majority in favor, it gets approved. So Proposition 1 relating to abortion rights took that path. The legislature chose to do it. Interestingly, you didn't see too many of these types of measures in the past, or at least not controversial ones like this one, uh, because until recently, there wasn't Democratic supermajorities in both houses. So that's why I think you'll probably start seeing more of these in the future. Um, moving down the line, you see Proposition 26, 27. Those are traditional initiatives, uh, actually initiative constitutional amendments. So in California, unlike some other states, the initiative process you can use to amend the Constitution, all it takes is you to collect signatures equal to 8% of the last vote for governor. And then it's not a supermajority vote, just up or down vote. 50% plus one takes it to amend the Constitution. Prop 28, as we're going to hear about relating to art education, is an initiative statute. It's just 5% of the last vote qualified for the ballot. Uh, and that covers the next two, Prop 28 and Prop 29 and Prop 30. And then the last one is a referendum. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is also a process where you collect signatures to take it to the ballot. But what you're actually doing is calling into question a bill that the legislature passed. So the thing to keep in mind is with initiatives, it's someone proposing a law. With the referendum, this is someone who's collected signatures to put to the question to the voters, do you like this law that the legislature passed? And so it's kind of rare to see the spread of all these different paths for how things get to the ballot, but we, uh, we have it this year. Okay, great. So that's a, a bit of an overview of how the process works and how these measures got on the, the ballot. I want to say just a little bit more about uh, this project that the Rose Institute has done since 2014, um, and these are the, the students uh, who worked on the, the project this year, um, and many of them are in the room tonight. So uh, I'm just gonna read off names. I, I know uh, a couple of them are like abroad off campus in Washington and so are not here, so that, in, that includes Grace, but Kat I think is here, so why don't you stand up and uh, wave to everybody and get recognized. <laughs> You're gonna see you're gonna see Cat on the big screen soon, right? Okay. Um, Helen, I believe, is here. So, <laughs> Helen did both of the gambling initiatives. She took on a big sort of complex measures. So thanks for doing that. Marshall, uh, I want uh, uh, Nicholas to talk a little bit more more about Marshall and his role. So Marshall was the project manager for this whole project. Um, has been working on it for. Um, months actually and brought the whole thing together and he also uh, worked on one of the measures proposition 28 um, with 29 so Leanne got started she's not here tonight but uh, George is here and he'll he's on camera for uh, that measure um, as well and then uh, Anna who you will see on uh, the video tonight did proposition 30 and then uh, Catherine Murphy began the research work on the uh, referendum measure Prop 31, and then Ryan brought it home in the, uh, the video as well. So a big group. Um, and one of the things that's great about uh, being a faculty member here and involved in the institutes is you get to work you know, very closely with you guys, the students, on projects like this. And it's very uh, it's rewarding for us. And um, it was great to get Nicholas or um, pull him back in uh, to CMC and, and working on this project. Okay, um, let's, let's get started. Shall we get started uh, with Proposition 1? And so uh, I think the way we're gonna, with, with 1 and with 30s, we'll start with the video and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So I, I'm hoping this is gonna work. In the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade, should California explicitly make access to abortion and contraceptives a state constitutional right? That's the question before voters with Proposition 1 on California's November ballot. This summer, in a case called Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the U.S. Constitution does not establish a federal right to abortion, expressly overruling precedent set nearly 50 years ago in Roe v. Wade. The Dobbs decision gave states wide leeway to either protect or restrict abortion. It did not overturn state laws like California's protecting abortion rights. 
For decades, the California Supreme Court has maintained that California state constitutional rights, including the right to privacy, protect a woman's fundamental right to choose whether to bear children. Under current California law, a pregnant woman has an absolute right to abortion before the fetus is viable. After viability, a woman may obtain an abortion when it's necessary to protect her life or health. In response to Dobbs, the legislature placed Prop 1 on the ballot to expressly protect reproductive rights in the California Constitution. The amendment says, the state shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions, which includes their fundamental right to choose to have an abortion and their fundamental right to choose or refuse contraceptives. It is unclear whether courts will interpret Prop 1 as expanding abortion rights in California beyond their current limits. Supporters of Prop 1 include Governor Gavin Newsom, the California Democratic Party, Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, National Abortion Rights Action League, California Medical Association, and the ACLU California Action. Supporters argue that explicitly spelling out the right to abortion and contraceptives in the state constitution would better protect Californians against future attempts to restrict or ban this right. They also say abortions are medical decisions and should be made by individuals in consultation with their healthcare providers. Opponents of Prop 1 include the California Republican Party, Right to Life League, California Catholic Conference, California Family Council, and International Faith-Based Coalition. Opponents argue Prop 1 is extreme and would make abortion legal even after a fetus is viable outside the womb. They say Prop 1 would encourage out-of-state residents to come to California for late-stage abortions, which would increase costs for California taxpayers. According to the Legislative Analyst's Office, Prop 1 would have no direct fiscal impact because state law already protects reproductive rights. However, the LAO notes that if courts interpret Prop 1 to expand reproductive rights beyond current law, state and local government health care costs could increase. In summary, a yes vote would amend California Constitution to expressly include right to reproductive freedom by establishing an individual's right to use or refuse contraceptives and to have an abortion. A no vote would leave California law unchanged. As currently interpreted, the California Constitution already protects reproductive rights, but not explicitly. So, what do you think? How will you vote on Proposition 1? Nice job. That's good. Great job, Catherine. So maybe let me also give some, some context. So uh, when we put together the, the video voter series, a lot goes into it. We've got our student researchers, did the research find everything. It starts with the students putting together a white paper uh, and then goes through several revisions, like four, four rounds of editing and fact checking and making sure that we've got everything right. Uh, and then after that, once the students have a white paper, which will also be kind of published uh, probably in the next few weeks, they create a script, putting together the script that you see here. And with the script, we then come up with what are gonna be the bullet points to go along with that. And we've got other former CMC students who actually helped with the graphics and bring it all together. So the, the whole process is weeks and weeks and months to, to get this together. A lot of research by the students, a lot of editing and writing by the students. Um, and really, a, as you can see, a wonderful process. Wonderful product, excuse me. I would say with this issue and with a lot of issues that are um, controversial, contested, sensitive, uh, one of the real challenges is how do you craft a short summary of a, of a uh, measure, trying to be as objective, nonpartisan as possible, but also sort of give uh, the arguments on both sides. So maybe you could say a little bit more about that. What was, um, how did you envision um, making these videos as sort of nonpartisan, non um, sort of weighted toward one side or the other as possible. Yeah, the the difficulty with these really that the students encountered and had to work through was how do you how do you provide that objectivity in a nonpartisan frame, but really being very concise. These measures are often dozens of pages long, and to summarize what they do in two to three minutes, particularly while capturing. You know, you can't share all the nuance, but at least enough to give a fair presentation to it is, is difficult. And particularly to the issue of how do you make it fair, there's a lot of things that come into consideration that I at least wouldn't have thought of initially. So we decided, for example, we wanted visuals for each of the measures. And one of the questions was, okay, what's the visual we should put for something as sensitive as abortion? And initially we looked at pictures of people kind of in, in medical rooms or, or facilities where they might be getting care, but it became a big question of like, if the person is smiling, does that send 
a certain message. If they're sad, does that send a certain message? So ultimately we decided we didn't even want to go that route because it might seem too biased in favor of either in favor of, of abortion rights or against it. And so that's why we chose the Supreme Court as kind of a neutral picture to put along with it. But it also meant making sure that when we picked the ballot arguments, we were trying to put forth the strongest arguments that each side did so that people could get that full context. And with things that are real sensitive, like in terms of the language of abortion, trying to stick close to the language of the proposition so that we're not putting kind of our own voice into how that's framed. On this one, there was, there was one issue that I, I found most difficult, which was, uh, there's a, there's a contested question as to whether this measure will change the status quo. Because as the video explains, California has recognized abortion rights for decades. The California Supreme Court interpreting the California Constitution uh, to protect, uh, through the right of privacy and other provisions of the Constitution, to protect a woman's right to choose to have an abortion. And indeed also has interpreted the Constitution, we didn't put this in the video, to require the state to pay for, uh, for abortions for women who cannot afford them, right? And so it's a, it's a very robust set of state constitutional protections that already exist. So a question for voters here is, will this change anything? There's already pretty robust uh, abortion rights in the state. Uh, there is a question because under current law, uh, there is a, a sort of a difference that occurs at the point of viability that California, like a lot of other states, has uh, a tipping point of viability where prior to viability, uh, there's an absolute right to abortion post viability, then there has to be some sort of showing if challenged with respect to uh, uh, a, a rationale for abortion having to do with the, the, the health or the uh, potential life-threatening condition of, of the mother, right? And so one could read the language that showed up on the screen in the language of the initiative to sort of wipe out any restrictions uh, to later term abortions. But, and so the, the opponents, we put that in the opponents' arguments because they definitely claim that. The supporters um, are hesitant to basically engage that question. They say, that's a matter for the courts. The courts are gonna work out once uh, you know, this, this uh, is enacted, which it probably will be, right? So uh, we, we had to kind of wrestle with how do we um, address that contested question where the two sides don't agree. Um, anything more on that or should we move on to the next one? You know, maybe another thing on this one is kind of understanding like why is this necessary? One of the questions I've heard is, you know, California super majority is democratic in the legislature, very democratic state. Um, we're not one of the states where abortion rights are really uh, at risk compared to other states. So why is this really necessary? And I think this one, there are kind of two, two reasons. One is the policy reason which is even though currently the California Constitution does protect abortion rights, it's kind of in the same situation that it was with the federal Constitution, which is, as the student, uh, student mentioned in the video, it's not explicitly there. So if you think back to Roe versus Wade, the right to an abortion at the federal level was found in a right to privacy, which was itself found in a variety of other rights within the US Constitution. But there was no express right to an abortion uh, that was interpreted through Roe v. Wade. And so then you have Dobbs, which says, actually, there was no right all along. We're, we're going to overturn 50 years of precedent. And so California found itself kind of in the same situation, where the right to an abortion under the California Constitution was based on other rights and not its own explicit right. And so that's why this came forward on a policy basis. I think it's also likely that there's a political basis for this, too, certainly. Um, California is overwhelmingly pro-choice. Even a majority of Republicans in California did not support the Roe versus Wade decision. And so this is likely to be a very motivating issue for Democrats, and to have this on the ballot uh, is likely something that's gonna energize the Democratic base here in California. Okay, good. Let's, um, let's jump in to... In the wake of the U.S. Oh, sorry, uh, good to see you again. <laughs> uh, let's jump into the ones that probably most voters have seen the most about, which is sports betting, right? Okay, and so there are these two measures on the ballot, 26 and 27 both would introduce sports betting in California. The, Cal the, the United States Supreme Court a few years ago uh, overturned a federal ban on sports betting and across the country many states have gotten into this game, right? They, a lot of states see this as an opportunity to raise revenue by taxing sports betting and a lot of their 
Uh, the residency states are eager to be able to bet on sports legally, right? And so uh, this is now before California voters. And there's two alternatives, and they're really quite different, okay? Uh, if you watch the television commercials, it's all about where does the money go, right? Where does the tax revenue go from these, uh, these two measures? And so uh, you'll, you'll see here, down toward the, the, the bottom of the, uh, the graph here, that the, the taxes are different in the two things. So it's 10% uh, tax on sports betting at racetracks. Okay, so Prop 26, you just have to keep in mind, is in person. Okay, this is sports betting, but only in a few geographic locations in the state. It would be in tribal casinos or at horse racetracks. There's not a huge number of those, so it would increase traffic uh, to the, the casinos that exist and to the racetracks so that people would get an opportunity to vote on, uh, to, I'm sorry, to, to bet on sports in these locations, okay? The competing alternative put on the ballot by the online sports betting companies, DraftKings, BetMGM, those, those companies would allow you to bet uh, on sports on your phone, on your computer, at home, wherever you are in the state, essentially, right? Um, and so, those are the, the, that's the principal difference you have to keep in mind, right? One is in person at the casino, the racetrack, the other is online. Uh, the second uh, thing it has to do with tax. So for the, uh, the casino gambling, uh, all of the, the sports betting that happens at the Indian casino, that's not taxed. The only sports betting that's taxed under the law is that which is done at the racetracks. The, the Indian tribes who run casinos have a different way of sort of giving revenue to the state, which is through compacts, negotiated agreements, uh, in which they agree to pay a certain amount of their revenue to the state. So it wouldn't be necessarily guaranteed up front what the amount would be. Uh, if you look at expected revenues from the two sources, uh, from in-person sports betting, the legislative analyst where we get all our figures, says it would be in the tens of millions of dollars that the tax on betting at the racetracks, right? And then for the online sports betting, legislative analyst says several hundred millions of dollars every year up to possibly $500 million a year, okay? So different revenue amounts from these two things. And then this is where, you know, the advocacy comes in because uh, the online companies came up with the idea that if we promise to allocate a large percentage of this big dollar figure that we're getting uh, from a, the 10% the, uh, tax on our money uh, that we get out of sports betting, 85% of that going to homeless programs, right? There's a big sentiment, you know, any poll will tell you that Californians are very concerned about the homeless problem. And so uh, they were very smart in constructing this measure. They're gonna profit hugely if this thing's passed, but, and they'll be able to sort of throw off some money through uh, this 10% tax that would go to homeless programs, and then um, another 15% <laughs> would go to the tribes, okay? So do the tribes support this measure? No, they, they want the other one, right? Because there the tribes would control all of the sports betting with a small exception of the racetrack uh, industry, which there's whole, not a whole lot of it. This is mainly going to be in uh, Native American uh, casinos. And so they prefer 26. They're backing 26. They oppose 27. And so with that one, it'd be a small, much smaller revenue stream. And where would it go? It would go largely 70% to the general fund. And then there would be 15% dedicated to gambling prevention. We're going to actually increase, uh, you know, problems with, you know, <laughs> You know, the, uh, it's, I think it's prevention of addiction to gambling, right? Or, and then 15% to enforcement, all right? But there, uh, that actually has implications for who supports and opposes this as well, because money that goes, we're gonna talk about this later with an, another initiative, money that goes into the general fund has, is, it, there's a separate sort of constitutional requirement that a percentage of that goes into public education, and so, the teachers unions and others want money to go into the general fund and not to go into separately uh, segregated, allocated funding, okay? Um, one other thing 
there's these minor, more, more minor, sort of not headline provisions in these measures. With Prop 26, uh, a really key one is uh, if this passes, the Indian gaming casinos will start to be able to do roulette and dice games. And so it'll be like full-scale Vegas-style casinos. When they first got introduced in California, uh, they were able to do certain gambling uh, activities, but not others. This would expand this, the types of things they would do, not only sports betting, but uh, things like craps and things like and roulette and such, right? Um, the other provision in there, really buried, is that uh, it allows for uh, private citizens to bring uh, action against some gambling establishments, particularly card rooms, which is a, a com competing industry to the casinos, okay? So you're not gonna hear about that. We decided to put a little line in our video, if you look at the video, about the card rooms. All the money, most of the money, against Prop 26 is from the card room industry, okay? And it's a lot of money they're putting into this. It's a lucrative industry, who knew, right? But it is, and so that's, um, the challenge for voters, and I'll just kind of end with this on this thing. The challenge for voters is how do you sort out these differences if you're not paying close attention uh, between these two competing me measures? And so you're, you're probably getting cues from, the, maybe I care about homelessness, so I'm gonna go with this one, or, or whatever. Um, you, so voters look for cues, right? Um, it's also a, like a really interesting and important question of public policy as to whether voters have the capacity to sort of sift through into these minor provisions and think about, do I think it's a good idea for there to be private attorney general actions against these card rooms um, and other things, right? And so that's one of the challenges, again, in trying to explain this to a broad audience. How do you pull out these minor issues when the big issue really is, do we want sports betting in California? And if so, do we want it online or in casinos? And, and other thoughts about uh, these measures? Yeah, well, a few things. First, the, the thing about the private enforcement is really interesting because it's so esoteric, and I think most voters wouldn't really care about it, but as Professor Miller pointed out, it's, it's largely one of the big issues driving the opposition. And for those who uh, may not get this, this is just allowing private individuals to enforce the law. So like when you see those signs that say Prop, Prop 65 warning, there's like the state of California has found that this may cause cancer. Part of the reason why they have those everywhere is that any citizen can bring a lawsuit if you don't have that, instead of what normally is the case is the government brings lawsuits to enforce general laws. And so these card rooms are afraid that there's gonna be all this frivolous litigation trying to enforce against the card room, so that's why they're putting up big money to try and compete against it. It's interesting context because it explains where the money goes, but it's probably not the headline issue that's gonna decide it for voters. It's really gonna be, do you think gambling should be allowed or not? Do you think gambling leads to poverty or it's a free choice issue. Uh, do you support uh, large amounts of money for homelessness problem, uh, solutions? Should, is gambling a good form of travel empowerment? Those are kind of the big issues, but finding a way to at least integrate a little bit about some of these issues below the surface that animate interest groups uh, is kind of interesting. And similar to that topic, you know, this one, although uh, we started this off by saying some people may feel we have more initiatives than normal because the airwaves have been totally flooded with measures, it's mostly these two measures. Prop 27 alone has had $400 million spent on these two, on the pro and the con side for these measures. That's more than in the history of all ballot measures in the United States, we believe. Um, so the amount of money is substantial because the, the amount of revenue, obviously, that can be generated through gambling is substantial too. But it's worth taking, I think, a little bit of a step back and thinking about the initiative process and was this what it was designed to do? So the initiative process in California dates back to 1911. The progressives brought about the initiative, referendum, and recall, and the idea at the time was we need a check on the special interest taking over the legislature. The issue at the time was the Southern Pacific Railroad owned the legislature, basically, and so they thought if we got these tools, we could make sure special interests don't control the legislature because the people always have a way around the legislature. Well, kind of the irony is it's so expensive to get things on the ballot is that mainly the special interests are the ones who are having the big fights with the initiative process. So it's uh, an interesting reform that, with time, has in some ways shifted entirely opposite to what it was intended to be. And oh. Professor Miller, I do have a question for you on this one. There's a, a stat from PPIC, Public Policy Institute of California. They did a poll where they asked voters, do you understand, do you feel you have a good understanding of ballot initiatives? Some on the order of like 80% of voters said they often don't feel like they understand what initiatives do. 
Then they asked them, so do you support the initiative process or should we get rid of it? And some similar, like 80% said, don't get rid of the initiative process, we want to keep the initiative process. So we have this kind of weird thing going on where voters feel they don't quite understand it, but they definitely don't want to give, give away this power. So my question to you, Professor Miller, is with some of the detail that goes into these things, like is this the best way that this process should work? Should this be going through the legislative process or is it still good that we have this? It's very open-ended and philosophical. But yeah, I wonder if yeah you and I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, this pretty quickly because we got a lot more to go on. Um, and it's a, it's a big topic, but uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, reservations about this process for some of the reasons you described and others. Uh, and there's also things that can cause concern about the legislative process. There are reasons why reformers the beginning of the 20th century wanted to create an alternative to legislatures because they can be captured by special interests and, uh, and such. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, the best remedy if people have concerns about uh, abuse of the initiative process is to vote no, right? That's your, that's your check on this process. If you don't like the way that things are presented to you, the, the default option might be a no vote, right? Um, in terms of like public opinion, People do have frustrations about it, but they actually think that they're better, people think that they're better at making decisions than the legislature are. I mean, the polls show that as well, right? So, uh, it's, in a way, it's sort of a, uh, you know, uh, one of those things where people get frustrated, but they, they don't want it taken away, that's just All right, um, let's move on to the next one, uh, which is a tax on highest earners. Nope, nope, not this one. Uh, Oh, this is the different one, right? This is the arts okay. and music yeah. one. Yeah, okay, arts and music, go for it. All right, so this is uh, funding for art and music uh, education in schools. The background here is that most schools don't have dedicated full-time staff to provide art and music education. And so the goal of this measure, this initiative, is to ensure that they do. And so what it would say is every year we spend about 40% of the state budget uh, by law, by a prior initiative from 1988, about 40% of the state budget has to be reserved for education. And what this would say is that 1% of the prior year's minimum spending on education has to now be spent on art and music education. So this is in addition to that 40% baseline for education, we're now gonna require an additional 1% of the state budget, essentially, or 1% of that 40% has to go to art and music education. To give you a sense, this is roughly saying that each year the legislature has to spend about a billion dollars on art and music education. Uh, this is a really interesting one because there are a lot of proponents of this measure in support of it, saying that art and music education is key, it helps with creativity, with the development of youth, uh, but there are really no, not very many opponents to this measure. And it's kind of interesting because it's gonna allocate so much of the budget and yet there's no opposition. The only real opposition is coming from a few editorial boards that argue that this is, quote, ballot box budgeting. Ballot box budgeting, for those who don't know, is uh, often used as a pejorative, but essentially what it means is you are binding the hands of the legislature. And the basic critique, and it's really a philosophical one that goes to the heart of the initiative process, is who should be making these decisions on things like the budget, do you want the public to lock in funding regardless of context forever, or should the legislature be making those tough decisions? And this mainly applies in bad budget years. So right now there's a lot of money, but in bad budget years when you have to make cuts, this would prevent essentially any cuts. This would be locked in. And so some people argue that should be the legislature to decide what should we prioritize, art and music education or some other state uh, spending, and should be able to decide where to do those cuts. Um, Professor Miller, I did have a question for you on this one. So, as I mentioned, there's no, no, everything on your ballot, if you look at the ballot information pamphlet, there's a formal opposition to every single measure except for this one. No one has raised a cent to oppose this measure, uh, but as we mentioned, there's a lot of money at stake. Why has this not attracted any opposition? And I'll add, I don't think this could have passed the legislature. That's speculation, but it's so much money. This would have been a huge fight to pass in the legislature, so it's a little surprising that there's no opposition. Yeah, so the legislature is used to budgeting and having to make trade-offs between different competing interests. This allows people to you know, vote for something that seems popular and not really think about what the trade-offs are, right? And so in a situation like that, you've got a concentrated interest, which are art and music teachers, uh, teachers generally, the school system, they're gonna be getting more money. So money's somewhat fungible. So any money that had been allocated from public school budgets for art music education in the past can now be used for other purposes. Uh, you got a big new revenue source or, uh, for 
for art music education now. And there's, there's really no uh, buddy who's in the, in the immediate term going to pay you know, a cost for this. There's no sort of organized uh, opposition. And so concentrated benefit, diffuse costs, it just makes sense that um, that's the way this would play out. And um, you know, that's why a lot of people have concerns about this form of budgeting, because in a legislative context, legislators always have to be thinking that the, the competing interests are always in the room saying, you know, we need to uh, balance these interests when at budget time, right? And so this is not re normal budget time. This is a different deal. So that's, that's the, the primary principled concern about this. I mean, maybe uh, it's, it would be a good thing. I think probably would be a good thing to have more art and music education in, in California. But you, you need to be thinking about these procedural issues as well when you do your, your voting. Okay. Uh, dialysis. Okay. Dialysis. Dialysis is important. 80,000, I, mean, I did some research, you know, in pre preparation for these videos, 80,000 Californians are on dialysis three times a week. And if they didn't get it, they'd die quickly, right? It's essential for people with kidney disease. And it's like, it's, and it's a big industry, you know? So this is, this is like, the stakes are actually pretty high for this seemingly obscure topic. And uh, it's, it's also true that if you think that, oh, maybe I've, uh, this, why are we voting on this, on dialysis regulation? You might also say, oh, didn't we vote, for those of you who have been around California, didn't we vote on dialysis regulation two years ago? And actually, didn't we vote on dialysis regulation four years ago? Is this the third time I'm being asked to vote on dialysis regulation? And yes, it is. It's the third time. And it's the same players, okay? It's the SEIU, United Health Workers Union, is, has put this on the ballot, funded it, and it's the dialysis industry that's put up a lot of money on the no side and has successfully defended against the measures in the past, and now they're back at it again. These are like these rivals who are going at it, uh, have competing interests, there's backstories about what might be motivating the union to try to put uh, these things on the ballot. We didn't get, we, we actually touched on it a little bit in the video. This is one of the, the questions that we have to wrestle with is, you know, it's going beyond the scope of the ballot pamphlet in a way to, uh, to tell some of the backstory about what the interests are. And we, we did a little bit of that, but we also want to present, you know, what are the, the competing arguments for and against uh, this regulation? So that's, uh, I, I guess a question one might ask is, is this, to your point, that this, the, the, the initiative process, ballot initiatives were intended to be a way for popular movements to be able to uh, put measures on the ballot. And this looks like an interest group fight that's in round three, right? So is this an abuse of the initiative process or is this actually okay for us to be asked to vote three times in a row on dialysis regulation? And ultimately that's entirely people's perspectives and you could have differences of, of opinion on it. I think one thing, some states have viewed it from a policy perspective as an abuse. You have seven states that don't actually allow repeat measures for about one to five years that have tried to stop uh, just things like this. Uh, in terms of the opponents, they clearly feel that they're being kind of badgered by the proponents and do feel that it's an abuse. What the opponents have at least responded is they say, well, each time we refine the measure, and so we're trying to get closer to what's best. So previously, you had to have only doctors staffing these dialysis clinics. Well, we learned that there were objections that that would be too tough, so now we've opened it to doctors, nurses, other healthcare workers. So uh, I'll leave it to, to each of you to figure out in your own minds if you think it's an abuse or not, but there are competing arguments on this one. Okay. Um, this is the tax on the rich people. One. Okay. The tax okay. on the rich okay. people. So, all right. Uh, Prop 30, tax on top earners to support uh, ZEV uh, con conversion to zero emission vehicles and do wildfire wildfire prevention. And this is the one that Anna did, so we're gonna show the video and then have some discussion of that one. California has chronic wildfires, the worst air quality of any state, and large-scale greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. The state is committed to fighting these problems, but what is the best way of doing so? Proposition 30 on the November ballot offers a plan to raise taxes on the state's highest earners, to subsidize California's transition to electric vehicles, and to fund wildfire prevention efforts. Prop 30 would increase the marginal tax rate on people with personal income over $2 million by 1.75% to a total of 15.05%. 
the highest in the nation. According to the Legislative Analyst's Office, this tax increase would generate between three and a half and five billion dollars annually. 45% of the revenue from this new tax would help individuals, businesses, and government pay for new electric vehicles, also known as zero emission vehicles, or ZEVs. Another 35% would fund ZEV fueling infrastructure, such as charging stations. Finally, 20% would go to wildfire prevention and response, primarily for hiring and training firefighters. Supporters of Proposition 30 include the rideshare company Lyft, which has contributed the vast majority of funding for the initiative, California environmental voters, and the California Democratic Party. Supporters argue that California is not doing enough to address the biggest threats to air quality and the climate, vehicle pollution and wildfires and that Prop 30 would require the state's wealthiest residents to pay their fair share to address these problems. Opponents of Proposition 30 include Governor Newsom, the California Teachers Association, and the California Republican Party. Opponents argue that Proposition 30 is simply a way for rideshare companies to meet the state's electric vehicle mandates on their industry at a lower cost. Also, California already spends billions of dollars on ZEV incentives and infrastructure, and on wildfire prevention and suppression. And with the state's record surplus, additional tax revenue is unnecessary to fund these programs. In summary, a yes vote would authorize an additional tax on people with personal income over $2 million to fund zero emissions vehicle incentives and infrastructure, as well as wildfire prevention and mitigation. And a no vote would reject the tax increase and thus not fund new ZEV and wildfire related programs. So what do you think? How will you vote on Prop 30? Great nice job, job congratulations on that. Um, so yeah, Prop 30, this is one of the most interesting ones, I think, on the ballot. It's one of the highest revenue generating measures. Um, and as Professor Miller mentioned, a uh, tax on the rich. We've actually seen this before. A few years ago, there was another tax on, re on incomes over $1 million to fund mental health services. This one is now tax on incomes over $2 million. Interestingly to me, this one, a lot of the narrative is focused on Lyft, which often doesn't, you don't see a lot of really debate about the funder that's often in the background, but in this case, Lyft contributed some like 25 out of the $27 million for this campaign. And so there's a big discussion of, is Lyft just doing this for their, their self-interest? Um, which, of course, Lyft is doing it for their self-interest, but there's, uh, sometimes it gets a little hazy and people think that this initiative would, for example, give money directly to Lyft. And in fact, what this money would do is give uh, subsidies largely for people to buy electric vehicles, but Lyft, of course, relies on ordinary Californians to fulfill its fleet. And there is a regulation that's gonna come in that would force them to have 90% of their rides or their vehicles for their rides be uh, electric. So by having the general public have a lot of electric vehicles, it helps Lyft comply, but it's not like any checks are getting cut to Lyft with this. Um, Professor Miller, on this one, I think the other thing that really surprises people is just the lineup of support and opposition. You certainly have traditional Democratic supporters, you got the Democratic Party, environmental groups supporting this, and on the opposition, you've got Republicans, for example, I think wouldn't surprise people, but you also have Gavin Newsom and the Teachers Association, which is a strange lineup. What's, what's going on here? Yeah, so Republicans, Gavin Newsom, and the teachers, the CTA, right? Okay, um, strange be bedfellows in, in politics, right? Um, so you'd expect Republicans to oppose this tax increase, right? But why is Gavin Newsom opposing this and, and the CTA, right? So uh, I think there may be a relationship there. We talked earlier about revenue streams and where do they go. This revenue stream would be segregated away from the general fund and allocated these particular purposes, these environmental purposes, uh, but they would be exempted from the California Prop 98 guarantee which funds the public schools. So CTA raising his hand and say, excuse me, we don't really like these kind of uh, funding schemes as extracting a lot of money through taxes, but we don't get any piece of it, right? And so um, I, I can imagine maybe that that was influential for Newsom. He's probably feeling cross pressures on this one. Uh, the different key constituencies, organized labor, especially the teachers union is very important, democratic constituency for Gavin Newsom, also environmentalists, so it's, it's a, it's an interesting uh, cross-pressure situation. So that would be one uh, thing you, you, one, one could speculate about as to why he's doing that. Um, another factor possibly, and I'm not actually sure this would be driving Newsom, but there is actual concern, growing concern, that the wealthiest Californians might choose to exit the state. There's actually reasons why they choose not to or have chose not to, most of them. Um, some 
examples of those who have is Elon Musk, one of the wealthiest people uh, in the world, right? And he formerly was a California resident paying California income taxes. Now he moved his residency to Texas, right? Um, and so California is losing a lot of that income stream. And there might be other of those two million plus people, that top point whatever percent, who might say, especially because they're no longer able to deduct most of those state income taxes from their federal income taxes, that the bite is getting too big. You know, I like California, but I could actually, you know, find a way to live my international lifestyle or whatever based in another place where I don't have to pay those kinds of taxes. So moving from 13.3, which is already the highest in the nation, to over 15% for those highest income earners could be problematic for the state. And so I don't know if Newsom is really you know, sensitive to that or not, but there, there could be you know, public policy reasons as well. Okay, um, we've got one more, and then we want to uh, reserve the rest of the time for questions. California. Yep. Marina, again. Uh, <clears throat> this is the referendum. This is the one where the people get the opportunity to override the legislature, okay? And this was uh, a bill the legislature passed in 2020, SB 793, which bans uh, the sale of flavored tobaccos and tobacco flavor enhancers in the state of California. Okay, so uh, that's driven by public health concerns that the flavored tobaccos are appeal especially to younger people and could get them sort of hooked on smoking. And so the, the public health world doesn't like flavored tobacco and they got the attention of the legislature. The legislature passed a ban on these things. The tobacco industry, R.J. Reynolds, uh, Philip Morris, those companies said, look, we have this, this vehicle in California that allows us to qualify a measure, uh, halt it, its, its implementation until it's put before the voters, and maybe we'll be able to knock this thing out uh, by a popular vote through this referendum measure. And so that's basically what this is about. Will the voters of California ratify what the leg legislature did in banning these flavored tobacco products? or will they overturn that ban? Um, curious about the, the referendum procedure trends in uh, referendum is something that uh, hasn't been used a whole lot in California history, but sometimes. So uh, what do you see in terms of trends? So the, the thing that's interesting about, uh, about this is the referendum was kind of seen as like a process that wasn't used. In fact, from like 1950 to 2000, it was only used four times and then it was all in one year. So other than that, it hadn't been used at all. Recently, though, we've seen a referendum on the last ballot on this one, and we're going to have another one on the next one. And part of what's going on here is what a referendum does is it stops a law from going into effect. So even if you're, if you're an industry that's about to be regulated and say it's going to cost $100 million to your industry, you can pay $5 million about to qualify a referendum, and you'll pause that bill from going into effect for several years. So one of the things is that this is a good way uh, you know, to fight, and hopefully if you're a the proponent of the referendum to hopefully, you know, prevent the law from going into effect. But even if you don't, you buy yourself two more years without regulation by getting it qualified. And so I think you've often seen a lot of these recent referendums have been big industries that suddenly get uh, regulated that qualify a referendum to pause the implementation of that and in their perspective, hopefully overturn it. Um, Professor Miller, one question for you on this one. Referenda are, can be a little confusing. How does a yes and no vote work? Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing because the proponents of this uh, referendum, the ones who gathered the signatures, qualified it, um, put it on the ballot, they actually want you to vote no. <laughs> so a yes vote is basically agreeing with the legislature that this should be the law. A no vote is agreeing with the opponents that this should be vetoed. So it's a little bit uh, confusing because it's the initiators of this process actually want you to vote no on it. So just make sure that you've got your uh, your voting sort of like lined up. If you're, if you're for the tobacco ban, vote yes. If you're against it, vote no. All right, um, let's open it up for questions from the audience. While we uh, wait for questions, one thing I also wanted to add is to give a special shout out to Marshall Vesey, who's here. He was the project manager for this project. He helped make sure all the 
uh, papers were put together, helped coordinate this whole process, a tremendous amount of work. So I wanted to thank Marshall for his work on it. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. So if you have a question, please line up at one of these two microphones and we'll alternate between the two. And when you come up, give a brief introduction, say your name, your year, your school, and then you could ask your question. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, my name is George, I'm a sophomore uh, here at CMC um, and, a, and a research assistant at The Rose. Um, and I had a specific question about Proposition 30. You know, we've probably all seen uh, Governor Newsom in, in these ads on YouTube or wherever um, come and talk about how it's a huge cash grab for Lyft. And I think one of the, the you briefly touched on the fact that Lyft is potentially required to, to spend a certain amount of money to make their, their fleet um, more electric anyway. Um, and so I guess, the, the argument there is that um, these incentives are, are paying for something that they're already going to be required to do that it, it could instead come out of their bottom line as opposed to sort of the um, tax paying Californians. Um, so is that, what, to what extent, how stringent is that requirement that's already been written into law and, and sort of, uh, I guess, how much can these incentives be expected to offset it? So the, the requirement is that 90% of the vehicles, vehicle miles traveled by rideshare companies has to be electric. So that means when you look at all their rides that they give, you calculate all the miles that they've used to transport people from A to point B, and that 90% of those miles have to be done with an electric vehicle. So the, the challenge for Lyft is if they, can't, if they don't have enough drivers who have electric vehicles, I'm not sure how they comply with that other than shrinking down the number of rides that they can offer, essentially. Or they gotta start giving cash payments to some of their drivers to upgrade them to electric vehicles, but I guess they'd have to then work out like some contract with the, the vehicle driver that they won't just run off with the new uh, Tesla that they've been given by Lyft. So uh, it is true that Lyft would have, I think it's certainly true that Lyft would probably have to spend a ton more to comply uh, if this is not the case, but what this measure does is it would help shift more quickly the whole population of California to electric vehicles and Lyft's benefit is just the pool of available drivers now are more likely to have an electric vehicle. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlie Hatcher. I'm a sophomore here at CMC. Thanks very much for your talk tonight. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a pretty high percentage of voters expressed some confusion about how, or the initiatives that are, that are on the ballot in a given year. So I'm just curious, what if, I don't know if this is at all likely to happen or not, but a voter says, oh, I want online sports betting and I want in-person sports betting, and these two competing measures both pass. What's the procedure if that were to happen? Great question. You want to take a stab at that? That's a very good question. And in fact, the California Constitution has a great answer for you, but it's also not the most satisfying answer. So the California Constitution says when you have two measures, and if they conflict, whichever one, and they both pass, whichever one has the most votes goes into effect. So it sounds good, very straightforward. Here's the problem. Whether or not they conflict is gonna be decided by a court and it's a very messy analysis that is not clear cut. So Proposition 27 in the proposition itself says if these two measures pass, we're declaring that there's no conflict and they can both go into effect. <laughs> now, it's good to have, but a court is not gonna bind itself to that. A court is gonna do its own analysis and try and figure out can these both go into effect or not. And I think part of that is gonna look at in passing mobile gambling or in-person gambling, did the voters really only intend to cabin gambling to one place? So for example, for the in-person gambling, if you look at the ballot arguments, they're saying it needs to be in-person because we can make sure that, that the youth won't vote because they'd have to show up in person, we can check their ID. And so you could see creative arguments that either they don't conflict or to say like, oh no, clearly if this in-person one gets the most votes, it was intentional that it's only in-person, not allowed more broadly. So. If they conflict, the one with the most votes, but do they conflict? I'm not clear. That'll be up to court. Thank you. Great question. Hi, my name is Karina Gillespie. I'm a junior at CMC. Um, my question is, I know that for Prop 27, that the companies have to partner with tribes to offer online gambling. Um, what does that mean? What would those partnerships look like? Is there any benefit for the tribes at all in those partnerships, or is it just like a formality? Yeah, I can, I can take a partial stab at it. So that is, you know, one of these minor provisions that get kind of overlooked that the, the mechanism for which, you know, BetMGM and uh, DraftKings get to enter into the California market 
is through some sort of uh, contractual relationship with tribal governments who do casino gambling. And the way I, there is a revenue stream that is that the tribes get a piece of uh, in these in these uh, arrangements, but it's less. I, I mean, it, it's absolutely true the tribes are opposing this, even though they would get a revenue stream and they'd be partners with the online sports betting. They think that this is. I, I think they think this is a threat to their uh, dominance of gambling in California. If not, it's not quite monopoly, but it's pretty close. And they have this alternative option that would keep them as the dominant people, so they oppose it. So that's basically what I know about it, is that they, they do, there, do has to be, there does have to be a partnership and the tribes would get some financial benefit out if 27 um, passes, but uh, they still prefer the other option. Any other? The, the only other thing I might add is, so it, it does have to be a partnership with the tribe, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean all the tribes are gonna get that deal. Um, the other thing is that in the way they wrote that, I don't remember the, the specifics of it, but you also have to be a, you have to have mobile gambling available in something like 10 states already or something like that. There's a certain state limit to be eligible. So they've kind of written it in so that if you guys in your garage suddenly come up with an app and you want to, and you even get a partnership with a tribe and you want to suddenly be competitive, you can't actually enter into the market. You have to be a pretty broad and established player to be able to enter the California market. So that's another one where like the details get really specific and they've clearly written this in a way to not allow too many online gambling companies to be able to enter into. Uh, but when you're covering a measure that's so broad, it's hard to be able to dig down that deeply. Yeah, one other just point about this difference between the uh, initiative process and the legislative process. In the initiative process, the proponents, this interest group, gets to draft the law exactly as it wants. There's no sort of committee process where other interests get to, you know, other stakeholders get to request amendments and get sort of into this, the system. It's, it's the proponent gets to write every word of that measure. And so in this case, they wrote it in such a way that's totally their self-benefit of these large online betting companies and sort of crowds out other potential competitors from the market. You know, I'll, I'll add one other thing to that. Um, in this case, these gambling measures are constitutional amendments because the California Constitution limits what type of gambling is available. So they do have to go back and amend the Constitution. If anyone want, if these pass and anyone wanted to change it in the future, you'd have to go back to the voters to amend the Constitution. But interestingly, in California, even if you did an initiative statute, so you're not amending the Constitution, you're just passing an, an initiative that has kind of the normal weight of the law but isn't a constitutional amendment, California is one of only two states that says the legislature can't even change initiative statutes. So the only way to change that is, again, to go back to the voters, unless the initiative proponents gave the legislature the ability to modify the statute, which they rarely do because they don't want the legislature to change with the perfect language that they've created for, their, for themselves. Hi, my name is uh, Josh Morgenstein. I'm a sophomore here. Let me just say thank you so much for your talk. Uh, as a California voter, I, find it, I found it very helpful. Uh, my question is also about Prop 27. Um, so it mentions that 85% of the revenue is going to homelessness programs. Are there any details on what those homelessness programs look like, what sort of programs um, or housing projects they're sponsoring? Um, it just seemed a little vague. There is a lot of discretion, but they do have some subcategories within that, and they also have some uh, additional provisions within there, like dealing with mental health, dealing with housing. They also allow within that 85%, although it's, it's allocated for homelessness, they also allow a little bit of it to go to uh, gambling addiction treatment, even for just generally for the public. So they do have a few categories, but uh, it is fairly broad, is my, my recollection. All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Melanie Kala. I'm a sophomore at CMC studying international relations. As Josh, I'm also a California voter, so I'm incredibly grateful to have attended this talk today. My question has more to do with the actual format of your videos. When I engage with Republicans in California, they tend to vote on policies because they know other Republican organizations support those same policies. So I'm curious how you guys decided at what time in the video you were gonna include um, the political organizations and how they were leaning towards policies and what the conversations surrounding that choice were and if you were worried about um, polarized voting and in, in contrast to voters educating themselves on the actual policy. Yeah, great question. Um, 
So party uh, endorsements are influential for some people, and one of the things that is important in sort of for the average voter in trying to sort through these complex measures is to get some sort of cue. Okay, so the, endor the, the endorsement cue is one of the most important cues. So it might be, I really care about, you know, I'm aligned with organized labor, right? And if, if organized labor supports a measure, then I'm going to more likely be uh, supportive of it. Now, I might drill down a little bit, and there might be some confusing ones, like a situation where the Republican Party and Gavin Newsom are on the same <laughs> side, right? So it's not all, I mean, we, we're, I'm, I'm the last person to say we're, you know, we're, we don't have a polarization problem, right? We, we do, uh, absolutely. Uh, nevertheless, party and other endorsements are really important and helpful for a lot of voters who don't have sort of the, the background, the, the uh, education, the time to dig into these issues, and they need shortcuts. The other shortcuts that you could get are things like these 30-second ads, which are actually often really distorting the issues. And so I would say read the ballot pamphlet. We draw this information that we put on these videos largely from the nonpartisan ballot pamphlet that's compiled by the Secretary of State and the Legislative Analyst's Office. And we try to put the you know, op opponents and proponents and their arguments right out there in a summary form for voters to be able to see. Because it matters to people sort of which side um, uh, you know, people I trust are on this issue. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. There's actually been a lot of research showing that particularly organizational voting cues are extremely helpful for voters to try and decipher these often complicated measures in terms of you know you align with the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club likes it, it makes you more trusting that this is a truly a pro-environment measure, for example. The other thing I just wanted to bring up is California may be about to uh, do something that no other state has done related to this topic. There's a bill before the governor right now that if he signs it, uh, we'll make it so that future ballot measures will have the top three endorsers literally on the ballot itself. So currently you can see that in the ballot pamphlet. But in this case, you'd say, do you want to vote for a measure yes or no on your ballot? And it'll say, you know, these three organizations want you to vote yes, these three organizations want you to vote no. That's a very controversial bill to go through the legislature. Some people feel that's politicizing the ballot, has no place there. But the advocates who got it passed won the day with the argument that these cues help people understand these ballots that everyone is saying are, are these initiatives that people are saying is confusing. So we'll see if the governor signs it, uh, we'll be the first state to try that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan, I'm a sophomore here at CMC. Thank you for your talk and for the information. I was wondering specifically regarding referendums. Um, I know you, with ballot initiatives, if it fails, they can bring it back again in two years. But if, say with Prop 31, the legislature's um, law fails due to a referendum, are they able to just bring back that law in a new form in a few years, like a ban on uh, flavored vapes that looks slightly different from the one that they tried to pass? Or does that fall under the same um, law you were saying that California is one of two states where you're not able to change uh, voter initiatives? Yeah, so um, with respect to referendum, you, you get one shot at trying to overturn a law enacted by the legislature. There's a window of time, and you gotta, you gotta get it in there quickly. You, uh, you can't sort of come along three, four, five, ten years later and say we want to do a referendum on this law. Okay, so your option, if you're the tobacco industry, would be to go a different route, which would be to pass an initiative, which would be an affirmative lawmaking thing that could overturn what the legislature did and maybe put something else in its place, right? Uh, but the referendum mechanism is intended to be uh, an immediate, you know, within the, before, by the next election, opportunity for voters to vote yes or no on a recently enacted law. But uh, sort of on that point, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. You would think, well, why do you even do a referendum if you can do an initiative and lock it in? Because with a referendum, you could sort of overturn something and then the legislature could come back and reenact it, right? Uh, if they thought that maybe this ma majority that opposed uh, the ban on tobacco is a, it's a small majority, it's fleeting, we can persuade people the next time around or whatever. With an initiative, you're locking something in, a policy choice, much more decisively than you are with referendum. And so uh, Nicholas's point about why do they do this 
uh, I, I th and why is this happening more often? I think we'll probably see another one with respect to the fast food restaurant uh, law that was just put into place this, this year, uh, which allow that creates a new commission that's gonna set wages and working conditions for fast food workers in California, right? The fast food industry doesn't like that and they're gonna probably try to do one of these, right? To try to overturn it within two years time and more importantly to your point, to block it in the meantime, right? But uh, in terms of can you come back later to do a referendum? No, you can't do that. So just to play that out, if they'd chosen the initiative instead, then they would have had to deal with the law for two years before the initiative gets on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions and answers. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Miller and <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. I do encourage you to check out the videos. They'll be available early next week. We'll be sending out you know, social media and other things, so students will be sort of bombarded with all that. But if you're uh, sort of a community member, or otherwise, you can look us up at the, the Rose Institute website, roseinstitute.org, and uh, share them with your friends. I, I do think uh, these, these students did a great job on these, these videos, and they should be viewed by a lot of people out there who are having to make voting choices coming up in the next month or so. So uh, thanks again for coming.